you have to make yourself sound like 10 people when we start the recording because we want to make people really jealous of them not, themselves not being here. All right, so when I count down from five, you're gonna start clapping and cheering like nobody's business. You got this? All right, five, four, three, two, one. Slash bed enthusiast, and this is the opener. 
It's all about giving in and giving up. Before you become a contortionist, before you get turned into a pretzel, before you pretend to like it. Instead of giving them your heart, start giving them numbers, like a ticket dispenser in the deli section. They'll all start pulling at your meat. <laughs> Going cabsies is all the way, and you'll learn how to defend yourself with whisks and knives from wives whose husbands gave in to your temptation, even though they're the ones who came home to you. Give up the notions of monogamy. Give up the notions of marriage. There is not a single man in this universe that won't fold you into something hideous and mean. You don't have to be anonymous. You don't have to give them your name. But while those bed slats keep breaking, remember, you cannot easily revert to being tame. Suicidal jumping off dresser when one of our mom's door and me fell during the second largest bedroom. Has mattress in a cloud, two bites hit the ground. Bones bumping on the floor. This house has no skeleton, only air ducts where the most hated creatures go to die. Smell the air of getting higher, caught out of lung. Everyone's got one to spare around here. Don't walk through the front door, curl through the side door. It's unlocked like a bedroom, it's almost it's his room. Then get ready for a shake from the plague of the episode of Feet Away. There are satisfying screams in the hallway, no the mind. I'm not only only fresh out and pounding, it's knocking all the periods right out of my fucking bones. He was a cyborg out of commission. He laid in my bed with his pecs on hinge. I tried to repair his mechanisms, but I knew nothing about his inner workings. There was no manual to a person. How can one fix a machine if they don't even know how to sustain it? My fingers were wrenches, but the only thing that could clasp was his heart fog. Thumping red blue scrolled through my glass. I squeezed and saw the shape gave way. The only tears that fell were from my bleeding palm into his chest cavity. Glass shards crumpled in my fist. I busted all the love he had for me. He rebooted and screamed. Our world became white noise. I looked unscathed, the price to pay for being a heartbreaker. Two years ago, and it took me a whole year to get through. 
Um, so these next two poems are dedicated to that. Um, the first one's called Micro Tears. The body does not say yes when the mind says no. Instead, it lies there like an open capsule, packing in the pain you'll scream out when no one is listening. The pain you wish you could have swallowed in a moment your body didn't belong to. Uh, this one's called The Boy Who Drew Knives. Five sections. One. There's still a bruise from when I smacked my leg on his bedpost. It never faded, like his reputation for being a psycho that carries knives. I should have worried when he used to wait a blade behind his back, but it was an intimate moment waiting for him to poke at me. Two. I'm always the lock book without a key, but he sliced my spine and stood a few pages in. Where was the warning? He called me a masochist and silenced my jaw with soft jokes. He told me that I liked it. Three. The one time I made myself vulnerable was the last time I let false trust push into me. It doesn't take many friends to let you know you've made a mistake. His groping hands have grabbed all who were close to me like a parasite looking to infect a whole colony. How could I justify being the original carrier? Four. He has a minister of desecration, and I feel defiled. Part of me wishes the experience was an illusion, like slipping two white tabs under your tongue and watching geometric shapes pass on the scene. Even paper knives can cut you up the right angle. Five. The best part about the summer was the fireflies, because when they smash, their bodies still glow the same color, which is more honesty than I'll ever receive from a boy who draws knives. They would land on their shoulders, guiding me through the darkness of clasped pans that once held me in place. I think I'm going to do two more. If raining blood would bring us back to life, I would sit on rooftops pulling feathers out of cardinals. Like cascading plumes brush away some of our strife, lashed into your eyebrows that curl and twist whenever an augmented word crawls out of my mouth like an arachnid. For a man so afraid of spiders, why did you come to our house encased in webs? We're caught in a Chinese finger trap, but I don't want you to get closer to you than I already am. How about we put our conjoined hands on a table saw to see who loses a limb? Or we play limbo and see who's willing to go to Lois while conform the other's arm. Either way, this union is an out of control boxing match. One of us is going to be bloody and on the ground. <laughs> the maelstrom turns over and over. There is no cooking on my stove because all the pilot lights are out. My hands are colder than dry ice, kept in your mouth for too long. I don't remember who purged the heat, but I can't feel butterflies in my stomach unless I hand crank them, like the black circles around my eyes are just spinning, spinning. I can't stop the turnover from day to night, this half-light that feels as if a shadow fell that didn't reach its destination. My hurt pulses as you sit with me in a whirlpool, and I watch as I am a stone that resists the pool. Thank you for having me, and thank you for listening. Go on, awesome. Really sweet.
Uh, so while Agile is getting that for me, all right, so uh, August, the theme is hot summer night. Gee, I wonder why, it's gonna be cold then. Um, September is falling into autumn, and does Agile have any more themes selected? Um, October is spooky verses. Spooky verses, not spooky purses. I have, I make those, but no. <laughs> Okay, let's see here. Uh, fast forwarding a little in time, apparently our November 2nd Friday theme will be hunger. And we're going to, Agile and Vernio, I think, are going to do some sort of a poetry for food uh, publication as well. So people who bring in canned goods and other um, things to contribute to the hunger cause will be able to get that book. So if you want to contribute to that book, like to put, have, have your words in it, talk to Agile. Uh, we, yeah, so that will be a special foreplay that they'll be doing, and I think that's all for that particular announcement. All right, our next performer is a frequenter of Rating Nights events, author of Electric Company by Rating Nights. Please welcome to the staging area, John Burroughs. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here among you. Um, I very much enjoyed the fine young man who came before me. And uh, I'm looking forward to the sword fight as well. Um, I... Gravity. We'll start with a poem from my latest chapbook, which is entitled Lost and Foundering. Sweet Melissa. In my city of lost places, Melissa is on the ventilator a year to the day after Jerry was removed, and I will not know for two more days. It was just two weeks ago she declined to attend my Sandusky reading because she had pneumonia when she did not know it was really stage four lung cancer. In my city of lost places, they are now removing her breathing tube, and I have not seen Melissa since 2004 at a corner store on Prospect in Illyria, and we have not commingled since more than 10 years before that. It was just too difficult with one of us in prison and both of us married to admit ourselves emotionally conjoined since she had been my first turn on to poetry, King Crimson, and LSV. In my city of lost places, I remember her telling me about her dead twin, Vanessa, who she claimed to be while pretending Melissa was the one who had died in infancy. It was just Two sides of one woman, though. Like the one who made her children stay in their room so I could put her ankles next to her ears years after the one who had bloodied my back in childless ecstasy. In my city of lost places, I want to go see her before she is no more. But for the past year since she sent a card to Jerry's funeral, She's been afraid to let me see her, instead mailing me a 12-year-old photo to scan and return. And anyway, I don't want to make anything more difficult. In my city of lost places, a poem that will do Melissa justice eludes me. So I play my favorite Almond Brothers song on repeat. Remember the advent of my poetry and mourn the imminent over and over. <laughs> Sybil. Ares is my brother, building an illegal bonfire in my suburban backyard. 
Taurus is my mother, the origin of my poesy, bequeathing me her incongruous bull horns. Gemini is a roller coaster, mirror hook and grommet, full sore and plummet. Cancer nips at my back. Leo is a meanly masseuse, loosing wriggled courage where and when I least expect. Virgo is an exacting secret. Libra scales a mountain of excrement, finding balance at its summit. Scorpio is my adoptive father, stinging the air, my bottom now out of reach. Sagittarius prances deftly over my head, a thought balloon keeping would-be backstabbers at bay while Capricorn philosophizes disaster away. Aquarius, Aquarius yearns to be a fortunate oasis, while Pisces fishes for homeostasis, and they all revolve around me, the astrologer, brilliant in my white dress, gleaming relationship and illumination from the universal night. From Genesis to Exodus, after Prince Rogers Nelson. In the beginning, there was God, and God was much more than a B-side to Purple Rain, a single before I would die for you. God was the one I called faggot in high school several years before I knew better and became a true believer and pansexual. God was ubiquitous on MTV the summer I entered the Marine Corps at 17 and exited the Marine Corps, still 17. <laughs> Dazed, you're gonna have to fight your own damn war. God was there, purple on screen during my first blowjob at the appropriately named Tower Drive-In. <laughs> and he was always there on my clock radio in Wilkes Villa, seen and known, on scene and unknowable, in my homeless backpack in Cascade Park, plugged into the table cassette player at the Lorain County Community College Library, and in the background, as I went down for the first time on Cassie's Raspberry Bouray. God was still there, a prince of a man, as I made it through college, cut off my wannabe jerry curl, took a job at the gay bar, lost and found my identities again and again, and even went through enforced sobriety and concrete cell walls I watched 1999 come and go and raved unto the joy monastic. Joan Osborne asked, what if God was one of us? And he was, and he walked among us, and often we knew him not, especially when he became Jehovah's Witness and exorcised his songs from YouTube and bought into chemtrail conspiracy theories, Percocet pantomimes, and a fentanyl flatline. Because living can be painful, even when you're God. Especially when you're God. And in the 21st century, God was still here with us, even as TMZ declared him dead. And though I live on Alphabet Street, no song of mine can capture his new power glory. I love you more than I did when you were mine.
in our expedition. Unscrewing the spaces, hardware in roof beam, scream lines in silence, time live in electronic mime, verbiage nonverbal by design. Take, rake, hammer, and pull. Avoid torn skin, wool. Leap, light, lick at window. Unguru, sinew exposed. Tell them I am sent to you. I am sitting next to words I can't hear. Hearing words I can't sit next to. Daydreaming, nearly nodding. I still reach to my right, grab a random book from the shelf, notice its Ferlinghetti title, Wild Dreams of a New Beginning. Open it at random to page 22 slash 23. I am now contemplating my great effort to break away from using gerunds, realizing how difficult it can be <laughs> to resume, recalling that point 22 is a gun, that 23 was a cavalier small forward and famed bull shooting guard. Putting the book back on its black shelf with Homer and Frost, distracted by deep impressions, depressed to my distraction, I unsuccessfully resist an impulse to rhyme with satisfaction. This poem is not really disintegrating. I am still now. Okay, I want to read a new poem that I don't think I've read anywhere before, so uh, I don't know. It needs, needs work, but uh, there you go. It was kind of inspired by the, the prompt was that thing that was going around Facebook where you uh, post the number one song on your 14th birthday, whatever that might be. Uh, and so my poem is entitled, Odd Missive. Dear whomever it may concern, I have always felt upside down and downside up, like an hourglass or a cup tumbling down a mountain of valleys, like an alley full of endless avenues and dead-end streets, like a meetup nobody comes to, or a voice recorder in a landfill. I have always felt like a number one Diana Ross song on my 14th birthday. <laughs> Upside down. But also her subsequent single, I'm Coming Out. I have always felt outside in. And insight out. But never insight in unless I was mistaken or outside out unless my heart was breaking and I could no longer bear the indoors. I have always felt like a rooftop floor or a basement ceiling, like a numb feeling or the unreeling business of a word-proof letter, like an ungotten go-getter, a colander filled with holy water, like an arid pants wetter, a desert detour, an albino moor. The kind of hello who is talking to himself again, 
to whomever it may concern, even when it concerns only him, or not even. How odd. Sincerely, Miss Siv. <laughs> is the bookend to the first poem I read. Unfounded. In this city of lost places, my 15-year-old granddaughter is no longer hiding all the places she cuts herself to hide all the places she hurts. I imagine it's because she does not want to die, and the cutting makes her feel alive, or because she feels dead inside, or like hell. I can only speculate why, because she will not tell. In my city of lost places, there are six urns, two wooden boxes, a metal canister, and three fancier ones from the funeral home full of ashes and bone bits. Our dog's lucky and lady, her 18-year-old cat Cricket, my mother-in-law, sister-in-law Sherry, and wife Jerry Lynn, because I cannot bear to bury them. In my city of lost places, there is a light that never goes out. And there is an out that never gets lit. And there is an it that never gets fought. And there is a fit that never gets sought or wrought. In my city of lost places, the oyster is my world until it is not anymore. And sometimes still is. And there is a this that cannot be that. And there is an act that cannot be bliss. And it seems all things are hurting and healing and feeling like cutting themselves. In my city of lost places, a seamstress has come undone. A teacher has failed to master the lesson. And a doctor has caught his death. I imagine it's because she does not want to live, and the cutting makes her feel dead, or loved inside, or like, hell, I can only speculate and expectorate why when I do not know. In my city of lost places, it's the first anniversary of my wife's death. Her clothing is still in our dresser and hanging in my closet. And the black framed family photo collage from her hospital room still sits in my living room on her former makeup table. And her makeup is still in my bathroom with her tweezers and scissors and razor and whatever has not yet been cut is torn apart, and I feel her with me, and not, and realize sometimes it's easiest to love your mate unconditionally when she no longer expects anything.
If you are here and you have not yet paid your $5 for this incredible experience, please make sure you do that. And we'll also be happy to relieve your money afterwards too, but now is an even better time. Nice. All right, so first up, the stage is setting itself. <laughs> and we'll be right back in five minutes.